there's any reason you uh, don't want this posted to YouTube, let us know. Um, Romans chapter 6 will be our subject. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and let him lead. Not just because I forgot my glasses and can't read tonight, but ah. <laughs> also because uh, it just seems right. So off we go. Romans chapter 6. Okay. Good. Let me uh, just pass out this sort of crib sheet here. Um, all it is on the one side there is just Romans chapter 6, but um, it's divided up into paragraphs, which will sort of help us a bit to to work through it. I need one too. Um, and, uh, I need one too. Oh, I gave mine to yeah, Rich. Okay. Well, you said you couldn't read. Yeah, I'll hold it away far away. It's on the other side. But I, it's still important that we really use other translations as well. So it's, I'm not passing this out as if it's an exclusive translation. I, I think it's probably just the NIV as far as, as, far as I remember. Um, just, you know, just by way of um, introduction, it strikes me that I want to bring something to us to, to help us to realize when we gather like this in a tiny little circle in a church basement, there's something much, much bigger that's actually going on in God's kingdom. And uh, this, this chapter, chapter six of Romans is really uh, very critical. And it's um, many, many people have poured over it and, and also through the centuries. Um, and especially um, during a, a revival just simply called the Great Revival of 1904 to 1907, which was a worldwide revival that just about affected all nations. And a book was written that documents this particular revival called it on the wings of a dove. And the chapter headings in the book are the names of nations. So you can look up uh, South Africa, uh, India, England, Germany, Scandinavia, and it'll tell you how that revival came to that country and how it unfolded. And um, India was a major player in that at that time. And I just um, just want to read, there's something on the other side of this paper I handed out to you. I just want to read how it leads into Romans 6 is the point of it. Uh, there is a biography of an influential English woman by the name of Jessie Penn Lewis. She lived in the late 1800s, early 1900s. She was traveling in India on a speaking tour in 1903 and began hearing people praying for worldwide revival. The Great Revival began about a year later, 1904 to 1907. It was worldwide and, a, well, it was a part of our, the, we, it was actually a spark that ignited the beginnings of our, our movement, the Bruderhof. She felt that if any revival is to be meaningful, Jesus and the cross must be central. She longed for that. In fact, Mrs. Penn Lewis's life message was the cross, especially Romans 6. And there you have it again from over 100 years ago. And then uh, let's see, uh, just skipping down a little bit here. Romans 6 must not be taken intellectually as we often do, but rather experientially. And then a quote, just a sampling in a way from Romans 6. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that the old self was crucified with him so that the si sinful body might be rendered powerless and we should no longer be slaves to sin. I want to look at that in other translations when we get into it. Not, not, not right at the moment, but later on. 
Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. So you see who we are in Christ, what we have in Christ, and how we can walk in Christ. These things we may take by faith in the same way that we take our salvation by faith. Faith in God and his word, trust. We may come to see ourselves as God sees us. In fact, we will tend to behave and act based on who we truly believe that we are. Beloved, we are God's children now. Yes, as in Romans 6, we are crucified with Christ, dead and buried with him. But likewise, we have been raised with him in Christ in a whole new life, a whole new way of life. And just quoting uh, Galatians 2.20 and Colossians 3. I am crucified with Christ. By the way, think of this not theologically or, or intellectually, but really as experience. This, this is, you and I can experience what I'm about to read. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If then you have been raised with Christ, past tense, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Again, the past tense, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So that's just a little free introduction, no charge. So then turning to Romans 6 itself, um, probably um, the best is if we just, what should we, we could take it piece by piece or we can just read the whole thing through once and then go back over it. Is, that's what we tend to do. Isn't it? We do tend to do that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We're not very predictable. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I've done enough readings for some of who would like to read, uh, say, about half of Romans 6, and then someone else can read the other half? I'll go for half. <laughs> well, then, shall we keep on sinning so that God can keep showing us more and more kindness and forgiveness? Of course not. Should we keep on sinning when we don't have to? For sin's power over us was broken when we became Christians and were baptized to become a part of Jesus Christ. Through his death, the power of your sinful nature was shattered. Your old sin-loving nature was buried with him by baptism when you died. And when God the Father, with glorious power, brought him back to life again, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. For you have become a part of him, and so you died with him, so to speak, when he died. And now you share his new life and shall rise as he did. Your old evil desires were nailed to the cross with him, and part of you that part of you that loves to sin was crushed and fatally wounded so that your sin-loving body is no longer under sin's control. It no longer needs to be a slave to sin. For when you are deadened to sin, you are freed from all its allure and its power over you. And since your old sin-loving nature died with Christ, we know that you will share in his new life. Christ rose from the dead and will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. He died once for all to end sin's power, but now he lives forever in unbroken fellowship with God. So look upon your old sin nature as dead and unresponsive to sin, and instead be alive to God, alert to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay. Anybody want to pick up the last half there? <laughs> Where did you end? End it all. End it all. Okay. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its desires. Do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons for unrighteousness, 
but as those who are alive from the dead, that offer yourselves to God and all the parts of yourselves to God as weapons for righteousness. For sin will not rule over you, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Do you not know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching you were entrusted to, and having been liberated from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. I'm using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you offer the parts of yourselves as slaves to moral impurity and to greater and greater lawlessness, so now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free from allegiance to righteousness. And in what fruit and what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. But now, since you have been liberated from sin and become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification, and the end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ooh. So that is just packed light. <laughs> oh, my. It definitely stood out when Joe's translation was, you were given his wonderful new life to enjoy. That speaks to the experiential element instead of just the intellectual. I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, I think a lot of times, and I don't think I've even been guilty of this, um, we fall into the category of, of that early uh, heretic group, the Gnostics, who simply believed that what you knew was what saved you, and it was totally unrelated to what you did with your body. And so you could just sin all you wanted because you knew that, that Christ died for sin and you believed that, and then there was a disconnect between here and here. And so it was all based on knowledge. And I really do think that while no one would ever say that, I think a lot of people live that way without even meaning to. Probably. Yeah. They just they they don't grasp this idea that we're supposed to be in this process of being less and less like our sinful selves and more and more like perfect and pure Jesus. Having your cake and eating it. Yeah, you got to somehow have both. Yeah. I agree. I agree. That that's that's very. It's been prevalent over the centuries, but there for for. Scenarios split. Sure. Okay. You know, and, and I'm gonna just throw this out there, just to be like the instigator. <laughs> um, I think also over the centuries, um, there's been a uh, tendency to sort of preach and or think uh, along the lines of sin management um of what sin management sin management sin management so um and i'm not going to do a great expound on that a lot but we do need to obviously have our flesh under control and um not try and live in the, that kind of freedom that the world offers, um, but to live in the freedom of Christ. But it's much more than the freedom of Christ actually is, is experiencing that grace and relationship with the Lord more so than the awareness of sin and self condemnation guilt and you know, all the negative ways of managing sin um, and 
I, I have to be honest with you, over, over my early years of adult Christianity, I got to the point where I kept failing. And like in the next chapter, in chapter seven, Paul struggles with his sinfulness and how he said, wait with me. And it's like the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I do do, yeah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, and it's like, and and I was in that constant kind of struggle and literally one day let go. And I'll, I'll explain that. So one uh, one time I was caught in a riptide and I didn't know swim parallel to the riptide and I kept trying to swim. And it was like, there was an offshore hurricane, so they were 10 waves. So I, I was stupid that went like, body surfing. I got caught in the riptide. <laughs> and so, um, and I was I'm stuck. glad you're still here. Well, I'm still stupid too. <laughs> <laughs> and I was stuck in this riptide and I I was good swimming, and but I didn't know that that key and back to be sort of parallel. Eventually, you get you get to a point where you're past the, the grab of that tide, and you start to be able to swim more towards shore. Anyway, and I got to the point where I was totally exhausted, and what, because what I had to do is the ten foot wave would crash. And then when I came back up, I literally would get maybe four, five strokes in, and the next one, because it was a ferocious storm. And the next one would crash on me, I might be underwater, I'd come back up. You know, so it was that over and over. And finally, I said, okay, God, literally. And I let go, and I relaxed. Take me, God, whatever. And a wave came in, and it lifted me up and carried me over past the riptide. And so for some reason God didn't live. But but that same thing with sin it is so that's sort of a, a, a you know, actually a good illustration. illustration I tell you. And when I got to the point where I let go and realized he still loved me. He still loved me. It was his loving kindness that won me over. So now we should go to the altar. Paul, <laughs> 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 like, yeah, like, this is amazing. That's great. Thank God for Paul. That's Absolutely. He's God. Amazing. Amazing. Great man. And so <laughs> it is, it's his mercy, loving kindness, and grace. But it's, as you said, experiential. Yes, you experience the cross. And and for all the as much as we can comprehend the experience for all of this death as much as possible. Mm. But and somehow in a way, and obviously because I was supposed to be responsible here, I spent a certain amount of time reading and rereading Romans 6. But there's my personal experience in the last week is there's just a tremendous depth in this. And you can read it fast and superficially and it's think, so oh, well, okay, now we'll go on to chapter 7. But um, th there's something here. And, and what, what you described somehow where you were carried, there's a certain way in which in, in this chapter, God's trying to tell us he did it for us. Jesus did it for us. Like there's this one little uh, chapter 11, I mean, verse 11 says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. That doesn't say there's something you should do, something you ought to do, something you need to work hard at in order to be victorious. It says, just count yourselves, count your, Jesus did it for you, you know, and so I don't know. I, I think we're wired up to think that, that we have to work hard for our salvation. Sure, and you read stuff like this, and it's, it was hard for me to take it in. Um, you know. That was a, a transforming moment in my life when I realized and, and began to really believe 
that one of the functions of the Holy Spirit living in me was to be strong in areas where I am personally not strong. Mm. And so I confess to God, I can't do this. Left to my own devices, I'll go back to that sin over and over again. I proved it. And, and so I'm going to trust that your spirit living in me is going to provide strength. And so I began to call on the Holy Spirit by name in moments of temptation. And I would say, come and be my strength. And I'm telling you, that's what changed my life. Mm-hmm. It was amazing. Yeah. And and I think hitting me just reading and rereading chap- chapter six is that is just all to go along, agreeing with you, what you're saying. Jesus did it all. And so I, I don't have to paddle upstream. I don't I, I don't have yeah. to do it on my own. He did it. And yet you get there. That's the, the miraculous thing of that. It, it doesn't stay on paper. It actually comes uh, out in our lives. Yeah, it's incredible. The way it carries you. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, while I was reading this, um, temptation certainly came my way. They're all, I mean, you know, if you're alive and red thought and kicking, temptations are going to come your way, you know. But somehow to... To just we, we should I mean it's good to, that we should discuss his introduction, but then if we just read a bit and and try to take in what he's actually saying, and uh, it, it's remo- it's just full of remarkable. Uh, we ain't got time for that, Jeff. Pardon? <laughs> we ain't got time for that. We're reading that thing. Here. <laughs> I was thinking about you said before you said the wave carried you over uh, the wave. I was thinking about how you you swim away. You don't swim against it. You swim away. And I was thinking about how we can fight this sin. We can be sin uh, conscious, right? Just worrying about these sins and fighting them all. This, whenever Jesus is right over here, and we can just swim towards Him instead of fighting all these yeah, sins. Like yeah. that's the way I thought about. It. Mm-hmm getting out of that riptide you don't actually fight the riptide because you can't you can't beat the no, riptide. no you swim to you swim towards yes. safety yes. right yes. which is not upstream it's yeah. it's, it's not even where you think you're supposed to be it, going. it's not even where you think you're supposed to be going yeah where the world's telling you you should be right instead of that you turn and go the opposite direction which is towards jesus and then you get to the shore <laughs> yeah <laughs> so that's how I, I thought that's how the story was going to go but you said you got carried over it which is just as good but yeah. i was thinking about <laughs> that, that, that's so true because if, if you go take the, not the path to his resistance but the path toward him you know he says that my burden is light right yeah <laughs> and this is the way i am the way it's not the way yeah no. <laughs> In your mind, you're thinking, I have to go towards the shore, straight towards yeah, the right. shore. Our own understanding will lead us wrong. That's <laughs> the intellectual thing you're saying. Uh, yeah. It will yeah. not necessarily always get us to work. Yeah. And, there's some, and there's something that I'm still trying to understand, quite frankly, and that's the use of the law, the word law, especially in Romans 6 and 7. Romans 7, which comes you know, right after this, obviously. Um, uses the concept of the law 24 times in just one chapter. And that's the chapter that's famous for saying, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. I not do the good I want, the evil. I, that's somehow what happens to us when we try to approach life by the law. Working hard, trying to measure up, try, trying to like Paul, you know, swimming against the riptide. You know? I don't know. See, it's still a mm-hmm. question. And then in Romans 6, the Lord law is only mentioned once, and it's verse 14, and it says, For sin will have no dominion over you. Powerful statement. Sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What does he mean by that? What what is why did he say law? Why didn't it say for sin will have dominion over you since you are not under sin, but grace. not under the flesh, but under. No, it says not under the law, but under grace. Why law? In verse 14. 
But I, I mean, in broad strokes, is it just self-effort? I don't know. That's the first thing that comes to my mind. It's, it's because the law pre presents the patterns of behaviors that you must follow. Yeah, that's yeah. lower efforts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like you're you're either under the law and it's dominion over you, or you're under Jesus and He's the one you look towards. So before Jesus, you would look to the law for perfection, okay? but then after Jesus, you look to Jesus for perfection. So you're under Him. And uh, one of my favorite Todd White Todd White sermons or messages is about instead of sin conscious, we should be sun conscious. Yeah. Instead good. of focusing on our sins and what the sin's going to do and uh, and how we're not good enough and how you know, instead of that we focus on the son and us being a son and how you know Jesus, what Jesus did and how we are free under Him and and how we look to love and how He loved us. Like it's just a total different mindset than. I'm going to hell. I'm no good. Instead of thinking that, you focus on I'm going to heaven, <laughs> and Jesus is perfect, you know, and and He gives us the Holy Spirit and the power. Like it's a total different mindset where you could be totally negative all the time, focusing on how many times you screwed up in a day. Wow. Go back to chapter five, verse twenty, Jeff. Mm -hmm. Chapter five, verse twenty. Okay. Uh, I'm in Deuteronomy, Chris. Oh, no, well, you, you, you've left us. 520. 520 and 21. Oh, the law. Yes, yes. Do you, do you want to read it? Have you got it there? Sure. The Ten Commandments were given so that all could see the extent of their failure to obey God's laws. But the more we see our sinfulness, the more we see God's abounding grace forgiving us. Before sin ruled over all men and brought them to death, but now God's kindness rules instead, giving us right standing with God and resulting in eternal life through Christ mm -hmm. our Lord. That's interesting. So it, it, that's where you yeah. juxtaposition of law versus grace comes mm -hmm. from. Yeah, here, I mean, mine in a way is pretty simple. It just says the law was added so that the trespass might increase. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. And then it goes on. But um, somehow, yeah. Mm. And in Galatians, it says the law was our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. You know, in a way, I, I, we keep using Paul's illustration. It's not patented, is it? Copyright. Copyrighted, yeah. Um, <laughs> you could have been right there with me at Ocean City, Maryland. <laughs> no, it says the law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. You had to wrestle with that riptide to bring yourself to your bitter end to where you could turn to Jesus. It to led you to, to Jesus. Yep. Yep. Had to give up my own efforts. But... Yeah. And it's sure not a one-time thing, is it? I mean, I, I would say about Romans 6, I would say there's a, my experience in the last week or two with Romans 6 is there's a learning curve. I could read that and I said, wow, it's great, you know, it says this, this, and this. And then two hours later, I'm off doing something. I'm back, I put myself either back under the law or I uh, feel overwhelmed by temptation or, you know, so I, I think there's a learning curve, and yet it's, I feel it beckoning me. What he's saying in, in, in Romans 6 is beckoning me to all that I have in Christ. You know? that, that's the question. Have you been in a riptide since then? Yeah, I have. Nothing <laughs> <that's> severe. <laughs> I mean, literally, I could feel when I was getting my four or five strokes in, I could feel myself going back pretty deep. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, they'd be. I've ever been in one myself, but uh, yeah, it's so fun. Sure. And you know, there's a sense in which good swimmers, good swimmers, get into trouble or throw it because they take bigger risks, go, go longer distances, and they think they can overpower it. That's the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
I'm thinking about the Pharisees, and uh, I don't know if Jesus says woe to them, but they, they give them all the rules, but don't lift a finger to help them. And that's the way I think of being under the law. You have this rule, right? You have this law. But the law can't help you. It, it well, just, it just you condemns sitting. you, and you're under the law. So instead of being under that, you're under Christ, who is perfection, right? And who has showed us the way. But whenever we fail to lead, fail to lead up to, to meet up with Him, He cares for us. He helps us. He, you know, we're not under this dead law that can't help us. We're under Him who cares for us, is a friend to us, and has have power to give to us, it has life to give to yeah, us. Yeah, he has life to overcome. Yeah, yeah, it's so much better to be under Him instead of under the law. Right. Right. I don't know the thing of looking up to it, like you're looking up at this law and you're thinking, yeah, all it's doing is condemning me <laughs> and it can't help me at all. Right. You know. Right. I keep wanting to say if we could only be this inspired and this clear in what we're talking about right now for the whole next week, it'd be a piece of cake. <laughs> it just happened <laughs> May. But we must, I don't know what we do. We That's why you're supposed to meditate on it day and night, right? <laughs> Write it on your doorposts. And that's why the early wrap it to your head. <laughs> that's why the oh, early followers right of Jesus gathered together daily. They they yes. literally day by day gathered mm -hmm. together and provoked one another to love and good deeds, reminding each other of all of these things. Yeah. And it was because it's necessary. You know, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous, twelve steps. They say. You need to go to one meeting every day if you want to change. That's, that's a, you know, recovery. The whole recovery experience is, in a way, so much actually like the Christian life. Encourage one another. Yeah, stay, in, that stay, yeah. In, stay in the faith and encourage one another and you know build each other up. Uh, so, you know, if, you, and if you know someone is, is struggling, you'll need to you know, give them a call, or, you know, because it's it's tough, it's a tough world right now. <laughs> How things go on. Yeah. The the um man. I've been uh, thinking about this uh, Cain and Abel. Genesis 4, and the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry, and why do you look annoyed? This is the Amplified Version. If you do well, believing me believing me, and doing what is acceptable and pleasing to me, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, but ignore my instruction, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you, to overpower you, but you must master it. Cain talked with Abel, his brother, about what God had said, and when they were alone working in the field, Cain attacked Abel and his brother and killed him. But I guess I just I've been focusing on if, um, if you ignore my instruction, sin crouches at your door, and its desire is for you to overpower you. Same thing, son, just just to destroy you. Uh, and thinking about how it's crouching at the door, I just like that image of. Mm. It's just waiting there, you know, and, it, and if you don't meet together and if you don't uh, look to God and follow him, and that, it, it's so easy to be destroyed. If we go about on our own will, I mean, we're going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, it's be unbelievably hard to keep your marriage together for your lifetime, 40 years, or whatever, uh, and not fall into the, the sin and be destroyed. I mean, look, I mean, so many people are being destroyed by sin. And it's just crouching and waiting for us. We have to, I know, I know one time, like six years ago, you said, when we walk out this door, we have to know that we're in a war. Yeah. And it wants to destroy us, you know, 
if we walk out there thinking everything's great and nothing's coming to kill us, you're gonna get shot because yeah. <laughs> yeah. you didn't realize you were in a war. You didn't realize you were in this war. Yeah, yeah. And I, I've always, re I've always remembered that. He said, "Don't walk out this door and think everything's gonna be great. We're in a war." You know. And doesn't it say there the offensive side of a war? It says it desires to master you, but yeah. you must master it. Now. What's interesting in, in that, of course, God can't say everything in one verse, but mm -hmm. but it doesn't say how to master. <laughs> right. And our, our impulses are just self-effort. That's our, mm -hmm. our first resource is always self-effort. <laughs> I shouldn't be crying out loud. <laughs> but <laughs> um, but uh, we know, we're reading about how to... Mm -hmm. uh, how to overcome it. It's in a whole different way. You know, one thing that um, I wonder how it fits in here that that kept coming to my mind is this verse, um, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where it says, he hath, speaking of Jesus, he hath made him to be sin for us that knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There's a people have called it the exchanged life. Jesus took on our sin, and we and and God has given us his righteousness. And there's something going on here in chapter six, um, where something from Jesus is being transferred to us, something uh, and something he did, and, and uh, you know, the cross, the victory. Um it's it's um, I don't know that that excites me that that uh, it, it's more than how can I put it it's more than just a matter of God conveying something to us which he could do that would be fine for that but it's more than that it's he's not only conveyed something to us but he has transferred something from Jesus into us and onto us and into our lives he's infused into us something of the cross something of the resurrection and um it, it's uh man it's uh, that's like sealing it in stone that, that's like man whatever god's given us it is it is rock solid you know I forget what the old, the old theological terms are for stuff like that, and I'm not even remembering the, the chapters and verses. But I do remember the concept, and that is that the, the Father actually um, imputes the righteousness of Christ on us. Yes. So that literally, when He look, the Father looks at us. Um, we know we're sinful. He knows we're sinful. But he has a, a legal transfer. Not a transfer, but an imputation. Christ still has his righteousness. But, and that, so that when the Father looks on us, he sees the righteousness of the Son. And he sees us as sons. And yeah, that blows me away. Yeah. It's very, very thoroughgoing. We should, we should really believe that. The devil doesn't have a chance. You know? yeah. That's why he, he cannot uh, possess someone who has that righteousness from Christ, of Christ. And make life nasty for us, maybe. <laughs> but yeah, the we we are additionally sealed with the Holy Spirit, and who dwells within us, far more powerful than Satan. But the cross itself is absolutely central. Um, I think. Again, that it 
you know, the church, a church or churches over time fall apart and had to uh, disintegrate if they don't refresh the concept of the cross on a somewhat regular basis and keep an awareness of it. <clears throat> but I think just as important as sort of heading up to the you know Holy Week and then the resurrection, just as important is that we have to then live a resurrected life and the and the life of the Pentecost. Um, and that new life that was given to us when um, we were sitting with when the Holy Spirit came uh, upon us. And so it's such a rich, <clears throat> um, you know, core theological concepts of the cross and the, and the resurrection and, and life and the new life uh, and the eternal advent, but it's only because of the blood of Christ. You know, the, the compassion and mercies of the fathers and sending the son to take on and somehow out of, out of Romans 6 you get a feeling that he God actually longs for us that we would experience actually experience this it's not just a theological concept it is, it is a theological concept but it's much more than that okay so let's let's um, <clears throat> Let's read, uh, I'll read um, verses one to four, and uh, it's just going to underline a lot of what we've already said, and in a certain way, it's almost a summary of the whole chapter. What should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We who have died to sin, how can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know? that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. See, he expects us to know that. Don't you know that? That you were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. It's, it's wonderful how whenever he speaks of baptism and burial and death, you can be sure that life isn't far behind. It's the next, <laughs> the next sentence, you know. <laughs> so, but the reason we can walk in that newness of life is, is because of first the burial. Or like George Fox said, no, no cross, no crown. Yeah, I like how the other thing said about the experiential, right? So we can say, yeah, we uh, we walk in the newness of life. You could say it as drab as you want. We walk in the newness of life, <laughs> but it's not drab. It's exciting. It's it's amazing. It's like I, I, you know, I struggle with that where you say something. But the profoundity of it is just over the top. It's just, it's unbelievable. Like, no, we take it for granted. For sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even our own consciousness, we take, we take a lot for granted. The fact that we're actually thinking about anything, <laughs> right? The fact that, I, I mean, anything. The fact that we're able to think about it. Right. The fact that we're able to even think is unbelievable. It's, it's mind blowing. If, if you can be mind blown without, you can't be mind blown without thinking, but. <laughs> You know, it's just—it's insane. It's crazy. It's—it's it's amazing. This, and then everybody has that life, right? But we have newness of life. We have life to the fullest, with joy and peace, and you know, <laughs> mm. and maybe you know. I think it's even harder for somebody that's been in and raised in a Christian experience and where you find these words are used, right, more 
where maybe you haven't been immersed in death and negativity and you know if you've been if your family had joy right and peace you would think that that is the natural way of life there's no cause for it to be any different <laughs> yeah and so the profoundity of it is harder for us to grasp I think. but you know i think we should just pray that we don't i like that thing don't lose your first love, right? your first love. You always go back to that and try not to lose that. That's hard not to lose because if you live your life in joy and peace a lot, it becomes normal, right? And then it's normal. And for some reason that's hard well, to... We expect that. We... Oh, then you expect all that and then that joy and peace is normal and you want more joy and more peace <laughs> more joy and more peace it's so not normal anymore, we don't want really to, to remain in first love to remain in the first love, 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 love it's not what we you know, yeah. are looking for for sure you know, to remain in that would be a miracle it yeah. would be supernatural for you to remain in first love so we have to pray for that that's something that we have to ask God for. It's not going to come to us naturally. That's a miracle. But, but like all loves, like in marriage, it matures. So maybe the thing that it's different, is even though it's at least we want to re retain that same level of you know, appreciation. Excitement, yeah. yeah. Excitement for your bride, mm -hmm. you know, that's... And when us re that's hard to sustain. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> hard to maintain for 40 years. <laughs> they, uh, I was rereading the last uh, half of the sentence there, I guess. Um, it says, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. But, um, and it made me think of the parable of the prodigal son, and when the father said, Explaining to the son who wasn't necessarily appreciating the moment, um, the other son, you know, he was once was dead, but is now alive. And the father had that excitement, that newness of life, or that that his son is alive, and he didn't know if he's alive or dead. But he, he said he once was dead to the law, to God, to you know, he walked away from it all. And the father had that excitement. Brother, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> he was not happy. <laughs> yeah, and there's always the temp the, there's always the temptation to be the brother, right? That, sure. It's very easy to do. Very I mean, nice to name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he liked your sacrifice and not mine. Somebody has it better than that. I did all the right things and you did all the wrong things and he still loves you. Yeah. Yeah. That mm -hmm. can be infuriating to be if you are humble. Mm -hmm. Humbleness is hard to teach. <laughs> no, it's not. I got it in an instant. Did you when I never noticed it? When was that? <laughs> I get to notice that. The unfortunate thing about humility is, is that it takes offense, basically, in order to produce the humility. Because humility takes what's given and doesn't give anything back even very well could even though they're wrong and you know you're right but humility says you know what i'm going to love them in spite of what they just said that's it only comes through offense and offense is easier if you don't know who you are so yeah like if somebody tells me i'm stupid i think well i think i'm smart <laughs> you can't tell me i'm stupid because i'm smart you know uh <laughs> That's not the humblest statement in the world, but 
<laughs> if somebody, you know, if you know that you're a child of God, right, and you, uh, who could drag you down off of that, right? Um, and that's the thing where you have to be humble, even though you're a child of God. But that's where we have to follow. I was telling somebody that I follow the man. It's Jesus. That's who I follow. You can tell me whatever you want to tell me, but I follow the man. And he, what he does is what I want to do. And you can turn the, you can turn the scripture all around and usually make it say whatever you want it to say, but you can't go against his life and what he did. You can't work against that. It's, it's a fact what he did while he was here. And you can't dispute it. He's undisputable what he did while he was here. You know, and that's, I think that makes it easier to follow him because we have his example of what, what he actually did. You can say you don't have to do this or you don't have to do that. Yeah, but he did that. You know, he took everything and gave nothing back to people that were killing him, murdering him. Right. And you can say, oh, you can do this. You can defend yourself here. You can whatever. But this is what he did. <laughs> we follow him. Yeah. Oh. Speaking of miscreants who have been forgiven. What did you do now, Jeffrey? <laughs> <laughs> Steve Mercer wants to greet everyone. Yeah, he, he's, say that yeah, he's, his, his problem is not just being truant. He's, he's, uh, he's got this eye problem. Detached retina. <laughs> yeah, not true. <laughs> true enough. So, but it's, it's good. I can joke about yeah, it because well. he's coming through it. Those detached retinas are right? They're terrible. He's he's uh, he's coming through it. We always knew it was detached, so they weren't quite sure. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's unhinged. <laughs> that's, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's let's read uh, verse five through seven, and and then any any comments, anything that sparks uh, in you from reading this. For if we have been united with him in the death like here we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like his. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the sinful body might be rendered powerless. I'd be interested in other translations on that. Rendered powerless. And we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Mine says, in order that sin's dominion over the body may be abolished. Oof. Mm. Is that dominion is the issue? Like later on in the end of six, it says, no longer slaves to sin. Mm. And when you're really wrestling with temptation, it's important to remember that, you know, the table is tilted in your favor. evil desires were nailed to the cross within that part of you that loves to sin was crushed and fatally wounded so that your sin loving body is no longer under sin's control mm. that's good that's good we keep word that something is united so that cross that united and Death, um, resurrection, um, and it brings to mind that concept of abiding in Christ. Uh, so, like he said, abide in me, and I am you. That the prayer was proved, and that I was not there any. But, um, but so again, it's in as the in the concept of, of the vine in France, and if you don't abide. By the uh, the branch would be cast into the fire. <laughs> um, but but if uh, but we cannot 
um, experience that resurrection newness of life if we are not united and abiding in that. He said that we're basically or become useless and don't bear fruit. Um, so it's it's all a gift, you know, just like you know, you know it's it's not because we because we united with the heavens, because we allow us to be on the and uh, um, and experience knowledge as well as experience the benefit of the death he took. Oh, we need to get you to use your preaching voice. Imagine <laughs> you're a Southern Baptist preacher. <laughs> No, I, I, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, pre preaching is not going to be a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to be able to utilize well. But, um, we can switch seats. Can you know, switch seats? I, I wouldn't do it either. <laughs> <laughs> Just closer to Jeffrey's. Uh, uh, you're always good for my case. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that. <laughs> they haven't said they can't hear you, so. No. <laughs> okay, sorry. Are they even paying attention? They better be. <laughs> so Jeff's yeah, always been. Jeff's yeah. always on there. What'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, I caught every word. Caught every, got word. every word. Got right. every word. Very good. Some translations for verse five will say, if we have, are in union with him in a death like his. And I've always to me, this is just me personally. It also may be others, but it's it's uh, it's relationship that I hunger for, union and communion with Jesus that I hunger for, and um, concepts are helpful as tools, but I don't hunger for concepts. I hunger for union, for relationship with Jesus, which He freely offers. You know, which is wonderful. Abide in me and I in you. Um, so um, I'm just finding that all through this chapter here, this the, the union that we have in Jesus, in his death and in his resurrection and, and the, the dominion over sin. Oh, in some cultures, they make you change your name, right? When you become a Christian, yeah, I'm not sure if that's in Jamaica or where they do. Catholics do. Catholics, so Catholics they, they give you another middle name, so to speak. Really, um, I've never heard that. Yeah, yeah. So when you you're you're dead, when you go through dead. confirmation, which is when you what's the symbolism? Like the Jewish, you died and you're a new person. So they give you a new name. Beautiful. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I think and in fact, it's used to it. I think because I, I have a, I had a friend who was Jewish. Um, and I made a comment once about something, and it happened to do with Joshua, and I mentioned Caleb. He said, you, meant, he said, you mean Caleb? He said, that's my given name. I think at Bar Mitzvah, his, mm -hmm. his name was Caleb, or Caleb. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a Jewish people. I went to Bar Mitzvah when I was 13 years old. My, one of my best friends was Jewish, and we all, mm -hmm. we all hope, pretty much the whole class went to Bar Mitzvah. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember in them changing. Of course, it may have done. Did you understand a word of what was happening? No, it was all <laughs> no, it was all in Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he went down to how many classes for months and months yeah. and months. So he passed everything, whatever, and it became. You know, they, yeah, we went to that bar mitzvah. It's actually right across from the high school. That was the old, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Jewish temple. There. Mm -hmm. They moved up the street a little bit, but they're still there. First time I ever saw uh, rare meat being served. <laughs> he passed out these plates of food and there was a lot on the I was like, mm. <laughs> that's pretty thick anyways. Come back next week, we're having lamb. <laughs> <laughs> We've already signed up. I've, been, I've had the lamb before. So, yeah. It's interesting.
Joe's original translation that he read from said, uh, in unbroken fellowship with God. That was that stood out to me too. And where did, did in unbroken fellowship yeah. with God? The first translation that Joe read out of. Nice. Um, when I was a brand new Christian, I, I mean, brand new, born again, happy, couldn't believe the weight that had been lifted off of me. I actually walked around like I was holding the hand of, of Jesus next to wow. me. Like I would hold my hand out like that. Who knows what people thought? Yeah. Yeah, it's a challenge to stay fresh um, in that relationship. You, the, 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 there was a the story of a um, a young fellow from S southern Sudan in a war torn area who was somehow lifted over to the United States by some Christians, and he began to experience Christianity in the United States for a while. And they, I'm sure they were evangelical churches that he was involved with. They meant it well. And after a while, with some urging, he said, well, they, somebody asked him how, what he, how he likes America and, what, and this and that. And he said, you people just don't take Jesus serious. And they, they, were, they were saying all the right things, but something was missing and that's a challenge to us to, to stay on the cutting edge you know yeah what do you th what do you think the definition of lukewarm is lukewarm what do you think that definite what the definition what would that is entail lukewarm? not taking jesus seriously it's what what would that look like what would a christian that's lukewarm look like <laughs> and what would one that was on fire be all hot yeah, I guess having a lukewarm cup of coffee, you know, it's not very pleasant. I, I'll give you an example. Somebody told me this because they were in Africa. They witnessed this. Uh, someone um, had, there's some kind of medical incident at a gathering, stroke or something, I don't know. And the person was non responsive. And they wit this person witnessed those people just go into action mode, not medically, but prayer wise. It was a good way to get the beliefs. And, uh, and he, he was just struck by the way they prayed. They prayed like this, God, raise her up. Just do it. Just do it, God. You can do it. And they, they, it, it was so real. To them. And the person it was like, and he, he was just, he was overtaken by, yes, the prayer was answered, but he was overtaken by the fire, <laughs> fire or prayer, yeah. you know, just absolutely no doubts, mm -hmm. no. Where was it? I don't remember. It was a third world country. It was an app. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. He couldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So we live in Luke warm, warm land. <laughs> <laughs> we do, we just don't know it. <laughs> yeah, that's always the what 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 is lukewarmness? What does it look like? Are we the, doing the answer that? that you have to know what is not lukewarm, what is hot? Like, and it is it's like that, you know, that story. Uh, right? yeah. Yeah, I experienced something similar, not not with any healing specifically, but just with the absolute exuberance in worship that the poorest to the poor people had. Yes, yeah. Um, they just worshipped him in a way that I had never seen in a group, and it wasn't out of order, it wasn't crazy, it was just with everything they had. And when I came back, it just was like, I was so sad. <laughs> I was sad for us. Because we just didn't, we don't get it. We don't understand that. And you can't just put it on. You know, it yeah. has to come right out of the heart. Yeah. Ah. But they worshipped out of their 
desperate need. Like they, they had nothing to rely on. They knew that God was their only hope. We don't know that. We're pretty satisfied with what we've got. We don't have many needs that are crazily unmet. And, you know, when we do, that's when we grab the horns of the altar and get down there. But then as soon as we get done with that thing, as soon as God gives us what we need for our lives, thanks for that. We're good. We're back. You know, See you next week. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I lived that myself. Like, I, I tell the story where I was driving my car, and it kept stalling. I was going from Morgantown to Charleston. It kept stalling. And and I was just I was praying so intently and so every muscle in my body was tense, and I was crying out. And uh, later, after, after all that um, happened, he just said, like, have you ever prayed for anybody else? <laughs> as powerfully as you were praying for your car today. <laughs> like, just like, uh, you know what? <laughs> no, he is charged. No, I have not. And that, you know, and he didn't say it in a way it was like condemning, but it was convicting. Mm. It did show me that there was a great difference between how I prayed for my own needs and how I prayed for everybody else's. I still love the Leonard Ravenhill thing. He's asked the people, do you believe in hell? Oh, yes. Everybody in church believed in hell. And you believe that people that aren't saved are going to go to hell? Oh, yeah. Well, what are you doing here for then? <laughs> and there's all those people out there. You believe in this hell. And you're just sitting here in these comfy seats. And you're going to listen to me tell you another story. <laughs> oh, man. You know? Uh, I just, Like you have a comfort zone. Yeah, I can do a lot better than I do, but I, I was up in Pittsburgh about a month ago we got stopped at a sub shop on the way back and uh, there's just one girl behind the counter and there wasn't anybody else around you know. we had our stuff and she actually put herself out to wait on she you know how sub shop is you can always be kind of custom she has to custom make everything for four or five people and we were all leaving and suddenly, without this, without thinking, it's just an impulse. I turned around, and she was in the back there. And I said, "Come here." She comes over. I said, "Just want you to know that Jesus loves you." And she just about went in the orbit. She just thought that was the most wonderful thing she had heard all day. <laughs> she forgot about the sub shop for this, you know. And then, if you have more time, the person isn't on duty. Uh, you know, there's other things you can say. The one I love the most is where, where Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's your heart. You know, if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into you. You see, you let your Jesus into your heart, and then he'll have a meal with you, and it won't be in the sub shop. <laughs> and, but I mean, I don't do that nearly in what I just explained. I wish I did a lot more, especially after. <laughs> what Ravens? What's his name? Ravens. Raven. Raven. <laughs> but uh, I, 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 I think it's the time that we're in. People actually are in with the desperate, and and yeah, wow. Um, hmm. Okay. Let's see, verse, we're getting there. Verse eight, <laughs> the, verse eight to 11. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, 
he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lived, he lives to God. And then verse 11 says, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ. He, it's, it's the same situation. He's not saying to do anything. He's just saying, count it. Make, make it. Just believe what's a fact, you know. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive unto God in Christ. You know, just when the worst temptation is attacking you and you feel the weakest and you're about ready to cave in, count yourselves dead to sin, alive to God. Anyway. I'll go ahead down there to 13, get that practical uh, application there. Mm -hmm. Re read it. Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. It sounds almost like... Uh, Put it on the altar sacrificial type offering going on there like i give you you bought me with a price right i'm bought with a price so i give you what you deserve i give you this life this time this tongue this hand or whatever at that point offering yourselves to him take full control let your life flow through me Use my hands, use my head, use my tongue, use whatever. Dedicating your body to his service. Verse 14, where it says, sin will have dom no dominion over you because you are not under law, but under grace. Um, that law is you again. For the riptide will have no dominion over you since you are not <laughs> under this. You are not under these waves. You're actually not under the riptide, but you're under grace. That's that's the New Testament right there. That's the New Covenant. New Covenant was the law, right? Basically, but now we are under the New Covenant of Grace through death, cross, and the resurrection. I like that phrase. But and that that wave that came in and delivered you—that that was just a little miracle there, wasn't it? I mean, that was. Was me. <laughs> <laughs> <Anyways>. <laughs> and could it have lifted you if you were still struggling and swimming against it? Or I, 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 the being relaxed was what allowed it to lift you, right? The being the yeah. giving up, the giving up part it, of you. I literally, uh, like I said, every time I was, I could feel myself coming back. Uh, swimming as hard as I could. But I literally, when I, let go. I actually felt a wave crest rise, and then yeah, it crashed. But I could feel at the top of that 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 whole stuff. So after the crash, and then when uh, come back up, I, I didn't feel that pull, and I started swimming again. I had hope at that moment. Uh, hardly any strength left, but I had hope again. And then it, it was. It was 
you ever hear that? Do you ever hear that experiment where uh, you put a mouse in a bucket of water? Uh, it'll only swim for I think five minutes, and then it'll give up and drown. But if you let it swim for four minutes, then you pick it out and dry it off, and then you put it back in. So, it'll yeah. swim for like an hour and a half. Oh, oh interesting. Yeah. You yeah. build up this confidence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it has hope. hope of being safe. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a hope experiment. Wow. Yeah. That's a famous one. And what was the creature? What was the it? A mouse. Well, Put a mouse in a, in a five gallon bucket. Yeah. It's half filled with water so it can't get it out. can't get out. It won't swim very long and it'll give up and drown. But if you let it swim for a couple minutes, and it looks like it's going to give up, and you save it, and then you put it back in, it'll swim for a long time. You don't have to, like, they take it out for two minutes and then put it right back in, like, not enough time, just enough to catch its breath, basically. It'll go for a long time. Because now it has hope that something's going to rest. That one of these times it'll be yeah. saved permanently. Yeah, hope is a powerful thing. And that's why we share testimonies. That's why we tell what God has done in our life because it gives other people hope. Mm. About the time he plucked me out of that bucket. Mm -hmm. Right. The bottom of the slip and slide camp. <laughs> We've actually had a couple of ministers who wanted to do away with that testimony time <laughs> in the past. It's like, uh, my heaven. <laughs> <laughs> I would have laughed up. I would have fell off my chair if anybody would have ever said that. A couple. <laughs> You tell them that testimony time a lot with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Pretty much. I don't mean to get too forced one. That was one of my... Uh... Oh, Lord. Wow. <laughs> well, here's our benediction, benediction guys. It's uh, verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin, Past tense. That's the past tense. We got to hang on to that. But now that you have been set free from sin, become slaves to God. The benefit you reap is holiness, and the result is eternal life. That's it. And what is eternal life? That they may know thee, <laughs> the only true God, and Jesus yeah. Christ whom thou hast sent. It doesn't mean endless, <laughs> because once you die, you're in God's realm, and there's no time. Anyway, you, you need to, have, can you make me a t-shirt that says, <laughs> life comes from him. If we know him, then we have eternal life. Yeah, his life is eternal. He is the only <laughs> eternal life. Uh, but, but to your experiential uh, concept. Okay, let me First let me pitch. dare to read you a little something. I want to entertain you. He's got something. Okay. That's why I had to end it before. No, this had time. Do ten minutes. <laughs> this this is a report from behind the lines in the Ukraine, and some of our guys are now with Franklin Graham with the Samaritan's Purse behind in the Ukraine and behind the lines that he has set up a field hospital there a good size one. that he he kind of majored in field hospitals and uh whether the russians are going to honor that and leave it alone or blow it to smithereens i don't know but we have other people who are in the surrounding countries um uh dealing with the refugees. And this is a young couple um, who is Seth and Rosalind, who are in Austria. Our, one of our communities happens to be there and the community itself has turned into a reception center for, for refugees. Um, it says, we've been here for two weeks now, um, together with Ulrika, a few new families just arrived and some have moved on. The biggest development this week is that most of the school age Ukrainian children started to attend the local public school in Austria. This is an ex exciting for the kids and they are apparently very happy, but it provides a lot of challenges. Uh, the obvious problem being that most of them do not speak German. Most of their parents are in the same situation, so cannot help with the homework or even communicate with the teachers. And of course the kids need 
a lot of school stuff, lunch boxes, good shoes, pens and pencils, some of which is being provided by the school, but much of it they are reliant on donations. We got our outdoor play area up, this is at the community there, um, and running this week with a set of swings, a slide, sandbox, mini scooter, and a volleyball net. And, um, and when, uh, when the weather's nice, we generally get quite a game of gang of kids. Um, and then I just want to read, she, she give, the next is just snippets of these vignettes of these people. And uh, I'll just read one. Marina is a mother of two who has become a spokesperson and a leader for the refugees since she can speak German. She's the only one that can speak German well and communicate their needs. She told us how suddenly life has changed. For the past eight years, she's been focusing on raising her children and securing an education. And then overnight, the country was at war and they had to flee their home. Now she is almost, has almost no time for relaxing because she's a translator. Um, she does everything from administrating COVID tests to enrolling kids in school and helping people with documentation and being a go-between between, between the, mayor, the local mayor and the local officials with the refugees. And yesterday she told us she had only slept two hours the night before quite an incredible lady considering that she is a refugee herself. And then each each one has their story to tell. So I just thought you'd like to yeah. hear a bit of that, you know. So she's in Austria, you say? Mm -hmm. uh, that's your community you're talking about is in Austria. The community, there yeah. Refugees all the way over in Austria. Yeah, yeah. They're all over the place. They're in Germany. No, no, I mean uh, from the Ukraine. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, the Ukrainian refugees are, I mean, I've, my other daughter is in, uh, is there 10 million of them now? Germany, yeah. And she says, you Sounds can get down to the train size, station, but... and the train comes through and stops, and a, a refugee or two, a refugee family or two will get off the train and stand there on the tracks. The train goes on, they're on the, on the, um, at the station with their luggage and maybe a couple of kids and uh and where they go and she's just well she's my daughter laura says people just by and large just take them in there's one of the larger towns there it isn't huge but it's a little bigger it has a hundred hundred families now where they just absorb them and just take them into their homes yes coincidentally it's a bit uh, four weeks ago, somebody made a comment on, I think it was Shelly's uh, Facebook, about a picture she made, and she commented back, and he said it reminds me, he said it reminds me of something from where I live, and she says, where, where do you live? He says, I live in Ukraine. She said, really? Okay, so they, you know, they started the dialogue, she just asked him a few questions there. He says, are you seeing any of the war where you where you live? He said, no. I don't know. I, I, yeah, I, but you and she so she tried to peel that back a little bit more, you know, and um, was was oh, what is she seeing on the news in Ukraine? Or this person seeing on the news. And it's not like what we see on our news. <laughs> it's not. It's like really weird, and that, that wasn't that long ago, right? No, I've heard that before. I mean, it was just a coincidental thing. Yeah. Is, would you say it's better or worse than what our news is reported? It's I I don't know if it's better or worse. Oh, so but it's different. That's, okay. There's yeah. There's I mean so again the, there's been a there's been two different regimes put in place over the last few decades. There's been a civil war last four plus years, um, but nothing was ever making it to our news until very recently for reasons you may be aware of. But, so it's like it wasn't even on the news radar until just recently. Yeah, yeah. And then, and, well, and then Russia comes in, right? So, yeah. Wow. Oh. 
Well, did you have fun herding cats? Pardon? Uh, did you have fun heard. herding cats? Cats? I, 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 I don't know what you're Herding on. cats. It's, it's, uh, it's how I describe oh, you leading mean, this Bible study. <laughs> <laughs> it's a euphemism. Yeah. And back to what we were talking about. <laughs> I found out the less I say, the better it goes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my. Should, should, can you pray us out? Sure. sure. Lord, we're truly, truly grateful you given us a lot to consider, and, and there's just so much truth here. Remind us, remind us, remind us, moment by moment, your life lives through us, and we are under grace. Let your life flow through us, Lord, and let it make a difference in everyone we meet. In Jesus' name, amen. Good study. Thank you. Good study. Yes. Hey, Thanks, you. <laughs> good study. <laughs> oh, dear. Stop recording. You guys, we, we had a good time tonight. All I know is we had a good time. Yeah. Good. Uh, you guys have a good night. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah.